One of the verses that I guess you would say kind of haunts me is in Judges chapter 16, verse 20. Now, there's lots of Bible verses that disturb me. Mark Twain once said, it's not the parts of the Bible that I don't understand that concern me. It's the parts of the Bible I do understand that concern me. And this particular verse, for decades now, has just struck me every time I read it. And it's dealing with the life of Samson. And in the 16th chapter, Samson is messing around with Delilah. He's in, in a place he shouldn't be. And here he's the anointed of God. He's a judge of Israel. And he's just messing around. And Delilah is in cahoots uh, for a bunch of money. She's in cahoots with the Philistines. And the Philistines are wanting to extract the secret of Samson's great supernatural strength. Because he's doing a number on the Philistines. And so she's seducing him, wooing him, uh, nagging, doing anything she can think of to get the truth out of him. And three times he tells her something that's not true. And so Delilah calls the Philistines and wakes Samson up and he defeats them soundly. Now the third time that he's not truthful, he begins to, to come close to the truth and it has to deal with his hair. But finally, she wears him down, and he's drunk enough, presumably, and feels bad enough that finally he says, I've never had a razor to my hair. And if my hair's cut, I'm like any other person. She sensed that this was for real. She had gotten to him. So she lets the Philistines know, I think this one's the real one. And so Samson goes to sleep. She cuts his hair. Actually, she has a barber come in and cut off his hair. And then she yells, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He leaps up as before, thinking, I will deal with them as I have in the past. And here's verse 20 of chapter 16 of Judges. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. That haunts me. That here is a covenant man, a person who is anointed by God to do God's will, but he has messed around with sin so much and been seduced by it, he doesn't know the Lord has departed. And the Philistines defeat him, capture him, and remove his eyes and reduce him to servanthood. Now there's a happy quote ending quote unquote, but it cost him his life. It seems to me that Samson was just kind of going through the motions towards the end and didn't realize that the Lord had departed. I wonder, do we sometimes do that? Do we just find ourselves going through the motions, but we don't realize that that anointing of God is no longer there, or that we've walked out from underneath the protective hand of God in some way, and we're just kind of going through the motions. Samson didn't realize it until he was attacked by the Philistines. And that's sort of how it is, isn't it? The storms of life come and we don't realize we're just going through the motions until the storms of addiction or the storms of anger or the storms of bitterness or rage or calamities or disasters or distresses come. And we don't realize that maybe we've not been building our lives on the firm foundation, on the rock, but we've just maybe been going through the motions and didn't even realize it. Jesus sort of talks about this in Luke's Gospel, chapter 6. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I tell you to do? Why are you just going through the motions? He said, everyone who hears my word and does it, now think about when we, when, we, when we look at the Word with the intent of doing it, it changes how we look at it, doesn't it? Because when you're thinking about, I've got to actually do this. If someone's giving me instructions on how to fix something wood-wise in my house, but I know they're going to fix it. I mean, they're the, the expert. They're just kind of going through what they're going to be doing with me. And in my mind, I can be going blah, 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 because I don't have to fix it. But when I find out they're wanting me to fix it, now all of a sudden I have to listen with a different intent, don't I? With a different level of focus. And I think that's what Jesus is saying. That when you 
when you hear my word with the intent of acting on it, it raises the level. It raises the bar of how we respond to his word. And he said that person who hears and acts on the word is like one who builds his house or her house upon the rock. And the storms come and it does not collapse. It stands in the midst of the storms. But he said those who, who hear my word and don't do it, they don't act upon it. He said those are the ones who are building their houses on the sand. But here's the deal. You can't tell the difference. One's a facsimile. One's built upon the rock, but you can't tell the difference until the Philistines attack, until the storms come. And then that manifests whether we're building upon the rock or upon the sand. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, which is one of our lectionary readings today, we find that the people of God have just been going through the motions again. And that even though they've got the temple, and even though they've got the priest, and Eli is the priest, and who's, who's, who, who has two sons who are bozos and deceptive, and they're exploiting women, and they're exploiting the poor, they're doing all kinds of stuff, and Eli is not holding them accountable, the people of God are just going through the motions, and it says there is no word the word of God was silent in the land. And so suddenly God begins to change courses. He judges the situation after a long, long period of, of time and, and mercy. He finally judges it. And he raises up Samuel, who at this point is a boy who is being tutored by Eli. And he speaks to Samuel. God speaks to Samuel. And Samuel, again, he's never heard the voice of the Lord. They're in the temple, but they've never heard the voice of the Lord. We're in the church. But maybe we've never really heard the voice of the Lord speak to our hearts. And Samuel had not. And so he goes to Eli, and he says, yes, master. Eli says, too much pizza, go back to bed. This happens three times, and finally Eli, the spiritual astute one that he is, realizes I think God's speaking to him. And so he tells Samuel, now the next time you hear this voice, say, here I am, Lord. Speak. And so God indeed does speak to Samuel, and Samuel ends up being the voice of, the reluctant voice of judgment on the household of Eli. And God switches the family lineage of who's going to be priest from this point. And no longer, in fact, will the be centered around priests, but Samuel will become a prophet to kings. And the voice of God begins to be heard again amongst God's people. Fast forward a thousand years, and you have once again the people of God just going through the motions, the ritual of the temple, going through all the stuff, but they're just going through the motions. It's empty. It's ritualistic. There's no power in it. And then God sends his only beloved son, Jesus. And the Bible says in John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 14, And the Word, the Logos, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, the word dwelled among us is literally tabernacled with us. It's... It, it, it's it's a reference to the tabernacle of God in the wilderness where the glory of God was the Shekinah. And at night it was the pillar of fire and at day it was the glory cloud. And Jesus now is that tabernacle, the glory of God in our midst. And God is doing a new thing and God's voice begins to be heard again amongst his people. So the passage that we look at today is all about is all about God coming to us and in some ways challenging our facsimiles, challenging our just going through the motion with something real and substantive and powerful. And it brings peace and life and joy and it brings conflict and division. It brings life and it brings death. Because it's God speaking and God's word coming alive in our midst and some don't like that. And some love it and are drawn to it. And so we see in this passage today the beginning of this voice calling people to follow him. 
In chapter 1 of John's Gospel, beginning with verse 42, it says, The next day Jesus purposed to go to Galilee. He's already called Andrew and Peter. And he found Philip. I love that. He found Philip. You know that when we say, well, I found God, actually, actually that's not true. God found us long before we found him. Amen? You can't find God unless God first found you. We don't seek God first. God begins it. God seeks us, so then we respond at best to God seeking us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 says, We love God because God first loved us. He's always the initiator. He initiates this incredible love for us. So he found Philip. And then it says, and said to him, come, follow me. Notice he doesn't say, believe in me. He says, come, follow me. That means there has to be some action. We have, actually have to do something. Come, follow me. And then notice what it says. The next three words, Philip found Nathaniel. Is it the way it, isn't that the way it should be? When, when you've tasted something, like maybe you have one of those, a piece of a, a pie, and you take the first bite, and it is, as some people in our family would say, to die for. Have any of you ever said that? You take a bite of this pie, oh, that's to die for. And what's the first thing you want to do if you have a to die for piece of pie? Don't you want someone else to taste it? Taste this. I mean, it's to die for. Now, I'm not going to let them use my fork, but I'll let them use something else. But we do that. When, when we see a beautiful sunset around our house, when we see it, Sunrise also, but I figure sunset relates to more people. When we see the beautiful sunset, we, count, we tell other people in the house, look at the sunset. Why is that? Because there's something innate within us. When we experience it, we want someone else to experience it. When we see this incredible play on television with a sports team, we want to, the, the replay of it, we want to tell someone, Come and look at this, even if you're not a big fan. This is incredible. What's that? When Jordan you know, was at his prime, and he could leap like over tall buildings, <laughs> it was amazing. Air Jordan. And when we first saw him emerging onto the scene, it's like even non-basketball fans were amazed. And they, look at this. And that's how Philip feels, because he had been found and felt like he had found something. Then he finds Nathaniel. What? What we have discovered we want to share with other people. We may need to learn strategies of how we do that. But there's something within us, if it's real and alive, we just want to share it with other people. And so Philip found Nathaniel and told him, we have found the very person that Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth, exclaimed Nathaniel. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Nazareth is, is a little village of two to 400 people. I grew up in a town of 500. My dad used to tell about this little town in Missouri. I won't mention the little village's name. I don't want it to be implicated in this. But a little town in, in Missouri, because we grew up only four or five miles from Missouri line. And he used to talk about this little town in Missouri. He said, it's not the end of the world, but you can see the end of the world from this town. And so that's what Nazareth had. That's the kind of reputation it had. It was not a place you think of as having anyone noteworthy from it. So Nathaniel is sort of a skeptic because he's a person of integrity and honesty, and one translation says he has no guile, meaning he's not deceptive, he's, he's completely honest. Can anything good come from Nazareth? I like skeptics. I think I always have, at least for a long, long time. I like honest skeptics. I like, I like seeking skeptics. Skeptics that are really seeking for truth. Now, I don't have a lot of time for the skeptics who just want to argue all the time. They're never going to come down on anything. They just want to, you know, discredit anyone else's argument. But they're not really truth seekers. But the truth seeking skeptic, I really like. In fact, I've said this for years. I would rather fellowship with an agnostic who's a genuine seeker than with a mediocre Christian. Would you? I mean, the, the real seeker, even if he or she's agnostic, 
I mean, they got something. They've got a passion. They're looking for truth. Where a mediocre Christian is like kissing your sister. And I don't even have a sister. It's just sort of ho-hum. It's the, it's the fish handshake. It's lame. Well, now, uh, Nathaniel wasn't that. He seems to be a truth seeker. Can anything good come from Nazareth? And I love Philip's response to him. Philip said to him, come and see. We can learn from Philip. I certainly can learn from Philip. Philip doesn't argue theology with him. He doesn't have a bazillion points that he's going to jam down Nathaniel's throat, you know, over and over and over. And long past, Nathaniel would lose interest in the argument. He just keeps jamming the point. He doesn't do that. He just says very simply, come and see. I think we can do that in different ways. He's saying, check it out yourself. Don't, don't rely on me. Just, just check it out. Check out Jesus. Check out his claims and see what you come up with. Jesus said it this way. He said, come to me. This is in Matthew 11. He says, come to me. Notice he doesn't say come to a religion. Come to a, an institution. He says, come to me. This building, it's, it's important, but it's only important because it houses a gathering place, the ecclesia. It houses those who are called out so we can gather together. But we're not coming to a building. We're coming to Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. The word rest here means uh, to, to have relief from mental and physical labor and turmoil. I'll give you rest. So are you weary and burdened? And then he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now this is a, a euphemism in ancient times for become my apprentice. It's the same basic thing. If we would say, come and become an apprentice of mine. That's what Jesus is saying. Uh, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Be my apprentice. Follow me and you will find rest for your souls. Now he's talking about an inward rest built up on the rock of Jesus. So we come to Christ for comfort. But sometimes we get locked into that mode that we just always want to come to Jesus to be comforted. But that's a means to an end. That's a stepping stone towards what's really more essential, and that is to follow Christ in order to be changed or transformed into the image of Christ. So we come to Christ for comfort. We follow Christ for change. And so when Philip says to Nathaniel, come and see, he's really saying, check it out. If, if, what's, if what you're doing is working, then keep doing it. But if what you're doing isn't working, then check it out. Come and see. See, see what Jesus is offering. You know, I think that's still very relevant today. That's what I would say to people today. Listen, if, if the way you're living life works, I mean, you've got peace, you've got joy, you have purpose, you have meaning, your life is, is growing, uh, you're growing as a person, you're developing, you're changing, you're becoming more compassionate and selfless. If what you're doing is working and has nothing to do with Jesus, keep doing it. But if it's not working, if it's not working that way, then come and see. Check out a different way of living where you do have an inward assurance, where there is a, a power. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean you never make mistakes. But we're not only forgiven, we're also being formed and changed so that when the storms of life come, we have something, a rock to stand upon, and we're being transformed into the image of Christ. Well, that's pretty good news. So if it's working, it's like Tiger Woods, I've heard say. I've never actually heard him, but I've heard him quoted as saying it, supposedly, that if your golf swing works, do it. Well, it makes sense to me. If what you're doing in swinging the golf club works, then do it. But if it's not working, then come and see. That's what Philip is saying to Nathaniel. Come and see. So, Nathaniel and Philip head off for Jesus. And as they approach Jesus, as they approached, rather, Jesus said, Now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. Other translations, a man in whom there is no guile. Nathaniel says, How do you know about me? <laughs> it's interesting. He didn't deny that because an honest man would recognize, Yeah, I'm honest. How, did you, how do you know that about me? Jesus replied, 
I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Now, it doesn't seem like that big of a thing. I mean, okay, Jesus, it shows, it shows maybe a hint of omniscience, a hint of this knowing that would be outside of human ability, but, I mean, it's not like he raised someone from the dead in front of Nathaniel. But Nathaniel exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. I was pondering this. Why, why such a, an, a, an incredible dramatic response to a fairly subtle supernatural manifestation? In fact, in John's Gospel, chapter 2, when Jesus turns the water into wine, it calls that his first manifestation of his glory and his first miracle. So I'm not sure what you call this. But evidently, according to John, it's not his first miracle. So this was enough, though, for Nathaniel to say, you're the Son of God, the King of Israel. What happened? Well, I think we could almost call this a first miracle. Because when the veil is lifted and spiritual eyes see, it doesn't require huge amounts of evidence. It doesn't require volume after volume of study. It's like C.S. Lewis, who had many doubts, who was an agnostic at least, and simply had not embraced the faith in England. But on a motorcycle ride, <laughs> he says from point A, he started as an unbeliever. And when they arrived at point B, he was a believer and he doesn't know what happened. Here's this erudite, this intellectual scholar, Suddenly, the veil is simply lifted, and he sees the reality of who Jesus is. I think that happened in Nathaniel. So when that happens to us, don't ever take that for granted. That's an incredible thing, because anyone can walk just going through the motions. But when the veil is lifted and you see that he is who he said he was, and that this is the pearl of great price, that nothing else holds a candle to it, that everything else is secondary to this, then you have seen in ways that only the Holy Spirit could help you to see. That's what Jesus said to Peter in, in Matthew chapter 16, when Peter confessed, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Flesh and blood didn't reveal it. The intellect didn't reveal it. It was a spirit to spirit, because fundamentally Jesus is a revelation. Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. I love Jesus' response. Jesus asked him, do you believe this just because I told you I had seen you under the fig tree? And then he says, you will see greater things than this. Then he said, I tell you the truth, you will all see heaven open and the angels of God going up and down on the Son of Man, the one who is the stairway between heaven and earth. A couple of things here. One, it's an, uh, an immediate picture for the ancients, the ancient Jew, to know that he's referencing Jacob's ladder, where Jacob saw this vision of God and the angelic beings of God ascending and descending. And then God changed Jacob's name to Israel, the personification of this nation. Now Jesus comes as the personification of the nation of Israel, and he gives this image of the angels of God, just like with Jacob, Israel's namesake, going up and down. Well, it's a picture of the glory of God, the very tabernacle we talked about. The Word became flesh and tabernacled with us, and we beheld His glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the, of, the, of the Father, full of grace and truth. So every time they would see a manifestation of God the Father through God the Son, they were seeing the angels ascending and descending upon Him. Jesus, this one who is the stairway between heaven and and earth. Seems to me the decision that this passage begs us to make is are we content with living in a kind of a facsimile faith or 
living as a museum? Or are we part of a movement where we're wanting others to come and see the reality of this Jesus, who is the rock in the midst of our storms, who is the peace in the midst of a pandemic, who is the calm in the midst of COVID, who from the inside out, as we center on him, he uses us to offer, if you will, to the world around us to be his living CPR, right? We are the living CPR of Christ. We're to live centered in Christ. I think what that means is to be focused in Him, to practice being aware of God, to practice being attentive to God, to practice being aligned with God. Now for me, that's head to heart. Many, many times throughout the day, head to heart. For you, it, it may be different, but you, you, you figure out what that means for you to be centered in Christ, and we practice that. And prayerful. For me, that means praying in the Spirit. So that means practicing breath prayers throughout the day, and I make up different breath prayers. Breathe in, Jesus Christ, Son of God. Breathe out, have mercy on me. Blessed Father, I worship you. Precious Jesus, calm my heart. Whatever it is, just we practice breath prayer. Sometimes it's petitioning. Being prayerful is petitioning for certain situations that, that we're asking God's presence to just be a vital part of. And sometimes it's intercession. I think in intercessory prayer, like the angels ascending and descending, we bring others to God, and we bring God to others. That's intercession. We're always bringing others to God and bringing God to others. And finally, rooted in the Word. So we, instead of just kind of reading some passages as a checklist, I got that done today, we learn to soak in it. We learn to let the Word read us. And like Jesus said, we we begin to read it with the intent of actually doing it. My wife makes this incredible frosting for German chocolate cake. And when Jake Hureman, who we just got back from Florida from visiting uh, Jake and Penny and uh, um, Wanda Childs, so just before we left, Jake and Penny lost their grandson, Cole. And just before we came back, Jake lost his brother, Larry. So all of this grief and all of this sorrow, and yet we're so thankful for the rock of Jesus in the midst of it and being rooted in the Word where we take the Word and we soak in it and we let the Word read us, and we let the Word become our foundation. And like Jesus said, we read it or we hear it with the intent of doing it, of putting this into practice. So when Jake has done some work over at our house and wouldn't take anything for it, Lorraine makes him a German chocolate cake and with this incredible to die for frosting because Jake loves that and he'll eat that. And so as we walk with Jesus, we find ways of serving him up that allow this living word in us to, to touch the lives of other people. Now, for me, I can look at that recipe, but as I'm looking at the recipe for making that frosting, Lorraine may be showing it to me, and here's what all... I'm just going, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that looks nice. Because I know she's going to make it. But if Lorraine said, honey, I want you to make the frosting, I'm going to listen with a whole new intent. <laughs> Never going to happen, right? Yeah, I get that. Never going to happen. So being rooted in the Word is really coming before the written logos. The logos and then speaking the rhema but doing it with the intent of acting on it. So beloved, 
Will you give CPR to a world that is in need? Will you be God's vessel of CPR to the world? And in different ways, simply invite people to come and see. To come and see in the name of Jesus. All my hope. Praise band, lead us in it. All my hope.